Well, well, welcome back to theCUBE. We are here at the NYSE for theCUBE Studio East, part of our NYSE Wired community partnership with theCUBE, linking Silicon Valley and Wall Street. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Just had the closing bell. We're wrapping up day one of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage on Wall Street. Uh, and of course, all the top experts on the East Coast are gathering the AI. We're here with Andrew, the co-founder and president of lastmile.ai. Andrew, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE here in the NYSE. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here, pleasure to talk to you about AI. You know, we are riffing a little bit before, so yeah. I'm excited for the conversation. Well, let's set the table. Give a, take a minute to explain what you guys do, where you are at in your journey, funding, product, stats. Give us the numbers. Yeah, so we are a seed state company. Uh, we raised our seed from Gradient Ventures, which is Google's AI fund. Uh, we raised 10 million from them. Um, and the company started from a team from Facebook. We all left to start this company, and what we're really focused on is how do we democratize this AI, this new technology for the rest of the, the world. Uh, essentially, we've been building it out at a company like Facebook, and we thought with generative AI taking off, how do we really build that out for yeah. everyone else and, and bring the power to everyone yeah. else as well. Uh, specifically, we focus a lot on evaluation and testing. We call ourselves Last Mile AI because there is a last mile of work that is so in incredibly difficult with testing, productionizing, and so that's what we help out with. We help with evaluating, testing, and, and bringing people along for that last mile. So the, the, the last leg of the journey, so to speak, in what context? App, infrastructure, what specifically last mile? Can you just share yeah. that piece of it, or is it all, all last mile? It's a combination of infrastructure and machine learning. And so when you're working with these large language models, you find yourself building applications and you want to either fine tune the model, you want to uh, make a RAG system, uh, you want to add your own data. Oftentimes it's really difficult to get the performance you need. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's even difficult to figure out whether it's working properly or not. And so what we do is we help you on that last bit of the journey, especially with testing and evaluation, where we want to make sure that you feel comfortable with what you're releasing to your customers. Yeah. And I know being living in Palo Alto for the past 25, 26 years, it was fun to watch the Facebook rise in 2007 when they opened up the platform. You know, and knowing a lot of friends that work there, I know for a fact it's been a huge machine learning effort. Yeah. Um, Vertex Ventures guys, you got Jonathan over there and a lot of heavy duty techies coming out of Facebook. There was a ton of work on data. Obviously, you guys were also where Facebook was known for open sourcing the open compute uh, spec which came out of Facebook and Microsoft. The, but there was a ton of machine learning Mm -hmm. at, at Meta, Facebook now Meta, and recently the AI stuff's been phenomenal. So yeah. you had large scale there. So when you look at the last mile, what did you learn the most from the Facebook Meta infrastructure that jumped out of you and said, okay, Facebook is, is, is a unicorn in itself, is in its own requirement. Yeah. Not everyone is Facebook from a scale perspective, but when you go to other people, yeah. they have those problems now. That's right. right. So mm -hmm. that seems to be the value. Yeah. What were those problems? How do they translate to the broader market? Yeah, really good question. So what was really exciting for us was working in the ML space. Uh, me personally, I've been in it for probably seven to eight years. Uh, always difficult for companies outside of these tech companies to train their own models. Uh, and so oftentimes as we were working on this infrastructure in ML, you know, there's basically tech companies yeah. who can uh, find the ML talent to build these models and clean the data, but oftentimes it's very, it's a luxury to have it. Mm -hmm. Nowadays with foundation models and large language models, a large bulk of it is there. You know, Facebook open source, mm -hmm. Llama, uh, a bunch of great open source models. And so now there's this kind of um, last mile worth of work to get that to work for you and to really empower your business. Uh, and that's what we saw, which is we were building all these things inside of Facebook and we found that we we're building it for truly from zero to one. Now that they've open sourced a lot of these, now all of these problems, interesting problems that happen at the end are still unsolved. And so let's go make it for the world. Yeah, what's great about it is the open source tsunami of goodness that has hit the market. It's been quite the developer frenzy. I yeah. mean, put it in perspective, for the folks that are watching that may not understand the, the scope and magnitude of what's happened just in the past three years, mm -hmm. even the past 24 months, yeah. the yeah. explosion of enthusiasm and the frothiness and the, the intoxication of the developer community has just been off the charts. Give us a taste. It's, it's the younger generation, it's the old and new, it's the systems guys and the young guns. Yeah. I mean, it's everyone's in. Everyone is so excited about it, I think, because it has that magical first moment. The first time you write a query or a prompt to ChatGPT, and it shows you a response, it kind of, 
it opens up a light bulb. We've seen it with executives, uh, engineers, data scientists, ML. Everybody sees the potential. Uh, and everyone gets excited for it. And so when you look at the open source community, there's a lot of popular open source uh, libraries and frameworks on how to use these models, chaining a lot of these models together, yeah. uh, more automation. Uh, now, agentic workflows. Mm -hmm. I, you've probably talked to a lot of agentic of folks we who are big into agent we, identify everything. <laughs> <laughs> we just wrote two killer, um, three killer pieces on The Economist about mm -hmm. digital twins and how that's going to oh, yeah. come from manufacturing to every process. I mean, it's just been an amazing run of just creativity. I think there's going to be some real breakthroughs that we haven't even seen yet. I think you oh, yeah. mentioned string chaining things together. Yeah. You're going to start to see people start doing more of that, less of this monolithic coding yeah. base. It's going to be a lot of like reusability, collaboration, connected, intentional yeah. relationships forming. That's the cool thing. I know we talked a little bit uh, about uh, machine level code. Uh, these models are extremely good at creating code and code generation. And so oftentimes when people start thinking about how computers are made and the operating system, you think about all of the machine level operations. And then you start thinking about what if they can be dynamically generated by a large language model. And this is why there's such a big frenzy on like, what is HCI in the future where human computer interaction, it feels like it's right for change. When you go lower and lower and you start using an LM. It's funny, you said HCI, I'm like, hyperconvergence infrastructure. No, <laughs> okay, this, the, well, they're both going on, yeah, right? You yeah, have yeah. HCI and the hyperconvergence, yep, yep. which basically made Facebook huge, um, is now being democratized yep. and open source. I mean, Jensen Wong at NVIDIA says, Gen AI is bringing supercomputing to the masses. They are, yeah. And that's the total democratization way, but human computer interaction, the other half of HCI, yeah, exactly. that interface is going to be audio. Hey, yeah, Cube, give me exactly. my videos. Hey, hey, Facebook, hey, Meta, you know, hey, my glasses, my Ray-Bans. Exactly. This is all now augmenting the human in the loop. Exactly. I think uh, the best way I view it is it feels like uh, mouse and keyboard is still, you know, a little bit outdated in terms of all of the other information, right? We talk about how yeah. audio, video, sight, all of it, yeah. it has so much data that can be used to help uh, convey your intentions yeah. and really transcribed it into making a device such as a computer work for you. And so yeah. it's exciting times. It is really, really Andrew, exciting. Andrew, you mentioned earlier about the machine. We, we were saying on cameras, just connect the dots for the folks watching that, you know, people are coding down to the chip level, right. kernel level, getting as close down to um, the, 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 the hardware as possible because there's efficiencies there that are game changing to the app, which yeah. translates into revenue or value, the value proposition of HCI and both sides. This is a huge trend. You agree with that? You're seeing that happen? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, yeah, check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No it's debate. Expensive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. No debate. So, my, yeah. I've been saying this for two years, last year, hardcore. Okay, but there's money there. Perplexity is new, yeah. and everyone's doing because there's benefits. It's, that's yeah. where the money is, and smart money goes to where the action is. Okay, what does that enable? I mean, that brings back the kind of the small ball, I call yeah. it the baseball analogy. Play some small ball, smaller code, dealing with memory back in the 80s when I was coding, you had to do memory management yeah. tricks, you know, right? swap memory, out the yes. disk. Now you have different constraints. You have, yeah. you know, design around how many clusters that you're dealing with. That's right. So the scale and the new AI infrastructure, yeah. you get down to the low level, there is efficiencies in this new abstraction layer on top that That's will right. enable data layers, data pipelines, hydration of data, so a whole nother level of coolness yeah. that goes on if you get it right down here. Yeah. Your reaction to that? The, the big bet with AI and ML always is that eventually it'll get a lot cheaper, right? Everybody's betting that it'll get a lot cheaper, which means once yeah. it does get cheaper, what are all of the tools, you know, constant and VC talk, picks and shovels that yeah. people will need to really scale up. Yeah. You can imagine all the applications, all the use yeah. cases that will use it because it's gotten so much cheaper. Right now, when you look at OpenAI's O1 model and you see how expensive it is on inference, uh, you start thinking, is this really possible to use that frequently? But everybody, everybody's thinking about how this is going to yeah. get that much cheaper. And so one step further is thinking, if it's really, really cheap, where can I use it? How can I use it? And how can I improve uh, my business? All right, Andrew, you guys just formed out of Facebook, you and your friends. Yep. Talk about the, the journey. What was the moment when you, you came together? What was the vision? What's your vision for the team? Where are you with the company? How many people are on the team? Obviously, 10 million is a nice seed round, not yeah. too shabby. Yeah. Okay. Um, all good. So, I mean, you're on a great wave right yep. now. So, you're looking good. Yeah. What's the vision and where are you? Yeah. So, um, we're currently a team of 12. Um, a lot of us come from big tech. 
and a lot of us been working either in the infrastructure space, the ML infrastructure space, or the machine learning space. Uh, and right now we're building that platform out for testing and evaluating, and we're bringing Fortune 500 customers to production. Uh, constantly when we listen to all of our customers and potential customers, their biggest feedback is, we've started a POC, it's really, really hard to get us into production, what can you do to help? And that's where we come in and we really shine. Uh, the more that we go through this, the more we're finding that this new flavor of ML infrastructure for Generate needs to exist. And so yeah. a lot of things that we're building yeah. applies quite well across many use cases. And, yeah. and funny enough, you've been in the industry, industry for so long, it's very similar technology yeah. to the old school ones, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like uh, yeah. whether it's a model server for Generate AI or a model server, it, it runs yeah. the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I talked to this old school security guy at yeah. the Google Mandiant conference, hardcore threat intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. And you know they're skeptical, but they are definitely leveraging they're leaning in, yeah. and uh, they said just candidly, "Look, it's just another application." Yeah, uh, and he's not wrong, but he's, he's but pragmatically, that's what it is. Just yeah. AppSec review. That's right. I got to onboard it. That's I'm going right. to go into production. It's the same game, but different mechanisms now because of the requirements. Yeah. That's exactly right. What are right. some of those requirements yeah. around the onboarding to production? I mean, obviously, Meta, you do one little thing wrong in production, yeah. thing blows up, roll back, yeah. try again, <laughs> oops. Mm. You know, like, yeah, the, the really wild thing is first, I think Meta has a big philosophy of online experimentation. You're testing things out. A-B tests are running all the time to figure out what's best for users. Uh, for Fortune 500 customers, especially FinTech, uh, finance firms, as well as insurance, they don't really have that A-B test. They have, uh, it's all, or not, like we cannot have anything happen where it's misinformation, any hallucination, like it needs to be rock solid. And so what we spend a lot of time is how yeah. do we build the right rubric and criteria? Yeah. And then how do we clean the data and make sure that your system's better so it can yeah. be launched into production? And so we find that we have the strictest review possible. And oftentimes uh, companies struggle to really figure out exactly why it's not right you know, they kind of have that eyeball test. You yeah. give it to someone on your team, they look at it, they're like, yeah. looks good. Somebody else says it doesn't work. Uh, so what we do is we decode that. Uh, we actually train models. Uh, we train models to evaluate it, and then we seed that information back into your system so you can refine yeah. it and get something production grade. And so it's been yeah. a, a really fruitful experience yeah, getting it must more be a lot of customers fun. happy. Yeah. So talk about the, um, the funness of, you know, having this experience where you're now going to be onboarding all these apps you had experience. Yeah. You know, the one question that I've been asking folks, and I'd love to see what your thoughts are on this, is that the word resilience has been defined from a mostly storage slash cyber recovery, yeah. kind of like ransomware, like, yeah. okay, oh shoot, we've been bricked, or okay, yeah. pay the Bitcoin, roll back. Um, recovery is a concept we all know, but yeah. Gen AI, how do you recover? Is there resilience? Is there observability? Are there the tools fully in place? If someone, and we saw this in the news, I think we covered yeah. it, where someone had an open S3 bucket with passwords unencrypted, it got trained. <laughs> okay, you got to unwind that. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is scary stuff when you say, I mean, say, okay, but there are people working on this. This is resilience. Yeah. This is yeah. going to be table stakes. Yeah. This is where people say, okay, show me the resilience and then you're in production. That's right. What, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, so a lot of the best practices on resiliency come from ML into the generative AI space. Uh, and I'll touch upon what's different, yeah. but you know, you typically want to know what's the data lineage, what's the data that's going in, audit logs. I want to know what went in and what came out, and I want to verify whether it's right or wrong and, and what tests actually ran. What are the suite of tests? And then ideally you also incorporate some tests on biases, uh, the ethics around it, and some companies have an ML committee they'll look and review yeah. as well the use case. And then the generative AI part, which makes it so difficult, is sometimes you don't own the foundation model. And so you're using somebody else's trained yeah. model and you're using it for your system. And so where does the liability lie? And how do I make sure that um, we are risk free? And part of that is really understanding which model are you depending yeah. on, right? And so there's open source models where people can at least inspect a bit more, run more tests on it before they bring it into their organization. Closed source models, you know, you're hoping that they, you the just, providers You're at have, the whim of the closed source. Yeah, maybe model cards or white papers on how they've yeah. done it, but you know, it is a little bit, you know, rolling dice of it because you can never really inspect. So your only real solution is on the closed side is have the good grounding yeah. and evaluating either 
in real time. Yeah. The zillions of responses. That's right, that's right. But it's expensive. <laughs> so they get you the other way where if you're validating it, then it is very expensive. Well, the good news about the Llama models, look at the cost side of yeah. the tokens and the, and the hosting. It's worth building your own infrastructure that's to right. host a Llama model than right. to go with the closed on that side. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, how's the journey for you guys? Uh, give us a, where's your heads at? You guys having fun? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's a great journey, I think. Now's the time to work on our business yeah, because yeah. uh, AI is really taking off and, and we've been working in the space heads down for a while. Now that AI is really taking off, it's fun yeah. to contribute back to the community, uh, bring in some thoughts uh, about how we're viewing the yeah. space and, and making impact with the product. Uh, a lot of exciting news. I think the last big one was O1 that came out, which was super exciting. Yeah. A model that does reasoning is really opens the door for a lot of new use cases. Uh, and we've talked about multimodality. Yeah. That's also a really cool one that's coming. And so yeah. it's exciting. I think this is the yeah. time to really, um, to really use these models and learn them because the space is moving so fast and the technology is so impactful. And so people ahead of it will yield the game. Where are you based out of? Uh, New York City, we're in the Empire State Building. So your team's here? Yeah, that's right. All right, so well, put a plug in for what you guys are looking for. You're hiring, You are you hiring? Yeah. What kind of people? What's the DNA of the company? What do you guys wake up in the morning and say, hey, we just love to eat machine learning for breakfast. Yeah. What's the vibe? What's the DNA of the, the company? Give a plug. Yeah, uh, the DNA of the company is uh, if you really like solving hard problems, especially with machine learning and infrastructure, that is our core DNA. Uh, we've been doing it for so long across many different companies. We're really passionate about it. And so when we see challenging problems, such yeah. as like the, uh, how do you trust large language models? We get excited and we start thinking yeah. about the research side and technology side and yeah. how to apply it. And so if you're really interested in that and you're interested in machine learning or infrastructure, uh, reach out to us in New York. And if you're reading papers on the weekend for fun, then yeah. you're definitely a good candidate. Yeah. I mean, the paper tsunami that's coming out, I mean, the, so many. the, the Research that's coming out, really amazing work. Yeah. I mean, I read a paper on LLM routing um, that last week. Yeah. Just, just serendipity, someone passed or link. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. They're talking about you know how to audition versus predictive LLM routing around. To your point about what language model should I found should I use yeah. at any given time? And that's that's a policy network yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's a networking problem <laughs> applied to a data layer. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> that's the beautiful thing that oftentimes I see a lot of computer science principles be brought back yeah. in. And so uh, yeah. deciding on which models to yeah. use is a, is a networking problem. And we see also quorum selection in terms of yeah. how do I select the best answer when I run three? That's a distributed data space problem. It's been there for so long. And so it, it's resurging it, but it has cooler names now. I yeah, think yeah. AI has given a yeah. lot cooler names. Yeah. And, and the scale and the magnitude of the yeah. data is phenomenal. Yeah. Well, we're in New York. We're going to be doing a lot more. We'll certainly definitely see it at our events where we do we put on with uh, NYSE and theCUBE partnering together. Great stuff. Andrew, thanks Fantastic. for coming on. Okay, you're watching theCUBE here. We wrap up day one of Media Week. Starting next year, you'll see us every day here, programming here at the NYSC. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.